I'm never gonna master pre calc if I can't even get past level four. I just realized this. Boy, I can't figure out the last question. It's not that hard. I, the, well, you're on B. You're on the B. Mode, but you failed the A. Well, I no, I just forgot to do the A one. Uh, you you on me? Yeah. What? Yeah. Have Pass a... me that gastropod. Do you guys want the shell? Oh, wait, Josh. Uh, no. Are these the ones we shot? Yeah, I'll look at the shell. Look at his gastropod. Pass it around. I want a good gastropod. This is a little one. You can just call it. Where? Why do you want recording people that are recording? Oh, yeah. Is everyone here? Is this the right one? I told him it was right on the screen. Does anybody have somewhere to be, like immediately? No. Where do you have to go? I leave for piano at 3.30, but no one cares about that. Actually, I need to tell... Okay, go. Just say after. Just say after, so... Okay. Freshwater mussels. Hidden filters of the river. Alright. What is a mussel? So, technically, mussels classify as both mollusks and gastropods. But more specifically, they're a bivalve. So in its like most simplest and root form, gastropod just means stomach foot. So a lot of things fall under its classification, such as like snails and other like sea slugs and stuff like that. It's just kind of like a slimy foot with its internal organs. Um, here are the definitions for gastropod and mollusk. Mollusk just means soft. So I guess it's like a little bit more specific. It was just referring to like the foot on the inside. Um, so yeah, it's kind of like squares and rectangles. All bivalves are mollusks. Are all mollusks are gastropods, and all gastropods are mollusks. Next slide. All right, so I'll be talking about just one of these, but there's two main ones in New York. Uh, the first family is Margarita Faraday, and the other is Unidae. So Margarita Faraday, they're a lot less diverse in like. I'm just running. They're a lot less diverse in the. Uh, species that they hold underneath their family. Unidae is a lot more larger and encompassing. Those are a lot larger in size. That one falls under Unidae. Um, Margarita Faraday mussels, are, more specifically pearl mussels, are a lot denser, but they're also smaller. The mother of pearl layer is a lot thicker, and it's what allows them to be able to develop actual freshwater pearls. Um, Unidae don't produce them, and they're a lot less pressured in terms of conservation. They're not nearly as damaged and uh, <clears throat> endangered. And the Margaret of Faraday lived like over 100 years old. So that's pretty cray cray. Next slide. Where do you find these guys? Here, click again. <laughs> All right, click again. Like there? Yeah, the like, like right there. one spot? Yeah. Right. So they're kind of exactly where you'd expect them to be. Just like flowing bodies of water, streams, brooks, primarily rivers. Uh, they do need a substantial amount of flow. Not exactly like a rapid level of like white water, it'd probably be a little too hard for them. But they need it for a source of well oxygen, water, and food particles to be able to catch in their filters. Uh, they thrive in areas with rocky beds and kind of like, like hard substrates with like sizes of cobbles and pebbles. Uh, this allows them to be able to like root into where they are. And they also don't like a lot of sedimentation because it'll clog their valves, which will prevent respiration and eventually starve them out. They also prefer bodies of water with low levels of sunlight and high populations of fish. This relates a lot to the respir uh, not respiration, reproduction, as they require fish in the reproduction cycle as part of their parasitic lifestyle. Next slide. Uh, where did you find all of these? Just yeah, these guys actually all come from the river. Yeah. So I have a couple shells with me. Um, I have two halves of one. These two fit together. And this is just a snail shell. But the other smaller ones that that are somewhere. My really is like are. Yeah, those are just Asian species. Cool. <laughs> okay. All right. So here is a photo of our river. So I'm gonna point out like I'm gonna go through and like analyze spots. So here, our first spot, right here. Yeah, click again. Uh, low flow, poor oxygenation. The depth is a bit too deep for them. It wouldn't be a very well or like good spot to find them. It's not primarily like. It's not a good uh, living spot for them. Here, a break before the rapids. It'll have high oxygenation, but it'll also have high levels of sunlight, and it's also not exactly the deepest spot for them. So they're a lot easier to be captured by predators. Next spot over here. Uh, these are the rapids. 
they're definitely a lot faster, and they're also gonna be a lot uh, shallower, so they won't be able to take root as well. And also, there's not gonna be many fish over there, as fish aren't gonna be exactly just chilling. They're like the fastest of rapids, it'll take a lot of energy to conserve just being able to maintain the position. Okay. And probably the best spot over here would be like about like a micro cut bank in the river. It'll have high shade, it'll be fair flow, lots of oxygenation. There'll be a lot of food particles, co food particles coming through. <laughs> and it's also most likely where you're going to find the fish in the river, which is great for reproduction. Next one, freshwater pearl mussel. So this is the one I'm going to be talking about when referring throughout the entire presentation. Their domain is Eukarya, kingdom is Animalia, phylum is Mollusca, their Bavalvia, uh, Unionidae, uh, Margarita Faraday, Margarita Fara, and then that's just specific. She's texting us. <laughs> she is. <laughs> Margarita Fara, Margarita Fara. Next slide. So here's a little bit of their biology. They're a gastropod. Here's a foot, like up close of their foot. It's a little weird, you know, kind of like slimy appendage. So there's a fair amount of specific parts of them. Starting off is the paleo line. This is where you, if you have, here, let me hand out the shell. Who doesn't have a shell? I'll take one of shell. Um, so, you can kind of follow along if you want. So, the belly line is pretty easy to find. This is, uh, if you find a dead mollusk, this is where all the muscles used to be attached. Michael, Bach, and Fuso to the main office. Michael, Bach, and Fuso to the main office. Um, this is also after their metamorphosis stage where all of their previous teeth will fold into. Uh, muscle scars are found on either ends of them. This is where their previous muscles that were used to open and close the muscle used to be found. Uh, the, pseudo, the pseudo cardinal teeth, they're like the little bumps found on the shells that help interlock and close the shell, along with the lateral teeth. These kind of fit into each other like a joint. Um, the beak, that's just the very back of it where the calcium first started building off of the muscle. And then here we have the cavity. So yeah, biology. Next slide. Wow. Here it is, pointing out one of these shells is somewhere in here. This is the belly line very close, the muscle scars. This one's a little bit fainter. The lateral teeth. It'll be different based on which part of the muscle you have because they'll be up, like complement to each other because they can fit into each other. The teeth, belly line. The mother of pearl section. The mop. Mop. Next slide. Lifestyle. Okay. <laughs> so, muscles bit of a boring lifestyle. They just kind of filter all day. Uh, they don't sleep. They do have periods of dormancy, but it's not related to light levels, even though they do have light receptors. Um, they will move. Here's a cool photo of them like leaving a trail. It's kind of funny. It's a cool way to find muscles in riverbeds. You can just look through the sediment. Um, some species permanently cement themselves to their uh, locations using a, some weird form of like enzymatic reactions. If you click right now, here's an example of it. It's a little nasty. This is primarily in saltwater mussels though, not many freshwater mussels do it. So yeah. Reproduction, here's the first step in reproduction. So here is a photo, very high quality, of uh, a male muscle, a male muscle fertilizing a female muscle's eggs. They're similar to fish in the way that they'll just, well, not similar to fish. So the eggs are held inside of the muscle and then fertilized through just ventilating water that captures the male sperm. Next slide. Uh, so after the eggs are fertilized and they've been developing for a while, next step is, it's kind of a weird one, some people don't know about this. They have lures built into their mantle that only female muscles have that are used to lure in fish. So the next stage after fertilization of eggs is a parasitic lifestyle. Um, it jigs its lure to uh, attract in a fish how like a normal fisherman would and once it bites it shoots out all of its eggs into the fish's gills and they're in kind of this weird stage called uh, glucidia where they're kind of like you know like the chompies from Mario that's what they look like you go to the next yeah. slide uh, oh yeah here's some more examples Ooh. of lures it's weird they have no eyes and no brains so it's really interesting how they've evolved to have lures that like so closely resemble a fish how the they next see? One. This really one has like eyes. Really yeah, how do they, they visually yeah. see that? Yeah, right? It's weird. Alright, I think next slide is a video displaying it. Yeah, here we go. That's so there so it is, flapping cool. its wings. Oh my god. That actually oh, wow. is just a little cool. That's right? actually Isn't that weird? Cool. That's really me. I could do that. <laughs> I would evolve to do that. You could not do that. Ooh. And then it 
blast them. Was it the baby? A little rough, poor fish. Uh, so here's the life cycle, uh, life cycle more in depth. So you know they start off fertilizing eggs, and then here's the glochidia. You click again, it'll be more close up photo. They're a little evil looking, right? Like here's their teeth and tongue that they use to attach to the gills. For a couple months, they'll be attached to the fish's gills. Some just attach anywhere on the fish because some mussels don't use lures. They utilize like slime webs that they hang in the water. And when fish pass through them, their babies get caught onto like the fish's scales. Uh, then once they live out their lives as glochidia, they metamorphosize into just juvenile mussels. If you click again, they just they just look like tiny mussels with their tiny little tongues and like uh, valve mouth. And then they rest eventually into um, the substrate. So usually, whenever reproduction occurs, it also result in the creation of an entire new muscle bed as one fish will carry just so many muscles that once they all fall and land generally in the same area, it'll create a new microhabitat. Next slide. Keystone species. These guys are pretty well. Camouflage is pretty cool. All right, next slide. Um, they're really important environmentally. Mussels, as we talked about earlier, filter all the water for rivers. Uh, they remove heavy metals, excess nutrients, harmful bacteria, unwanted algae, and debris from the water system which is really crucial to a lot of the organisms inside the river. And it also helps in terms of like human water systems. In areas without mussels, it takes a lot more work to filter out the heavy metals and harmful parts of water, like through water filtration systems. So mussels definitely play a pretty heavy like role in the filtering of water. Those provide uh, food for important uh, predators, such as otters, muskrats, egrets, herons, and other certain types of fish, primarily like crushing fish like catfish. Yeah, carp. Well, no, it doesn't matter because uh, microhabitats. Also, beds create like dense habitats that provide a lot of texture for algae. They create uh, fish beds for fish, and they make their own mini climate within these areas through maintaining the temperature. Um, and they also play a pretty heavy role in the recycling of nutrients. They'll take out certain chemicals such as nitrates from the water and recycle them into uh, back into the environment which plays a pretty heavy part in fertilizing the substrates of river beds. Next slide. Oh, this is just a mussel bed. It's pretty cool. Here I have a video of mussels filtering water. One mussel can filter um, about 10 gallons of water in one day. Ooh. So you can see the mussels, the body of water with the mussels becomes a lot clearer, a lot faster. Pretty cool. If you have a fish tank, you can keep them in there. It's pretty dope. Look at those guys go. What? Yeah, right. Filtering away. <clears throat> Next slide. Here's some muscle beds that I found online. These ones are the pearl muscles that I've been talking about. These are just some more muscles. I thought they're pretty cool. They each are kind of their own unique habitat. So they'll each cater to their own specific organisms that are living near them. So they're pretty cool and unique looking. I thought they were cool. Next slide. Status and threats. The sad part, right? Um, Mussels are one of the most endangered groups of animals in North America. About three quarters of the entire continent's 297 species are like heavily endangered. 35 of them have already gone extinct since the 1900s. Um, a lot of problems contribute to this, primarily human causes, as a lot of, they're very sensitive species because they completely rely off of the water and its temperatures and chemo, uh, the water chemistry as their filters. So changes in temperature due to like climate change or global warming or like pollution to rivers will really impact them. Here, uh, dams, they destroy the habitats of them. Uh, here, shown before, there's a nice healthy river providing a lot of habitats for these mussels. Next up, you know, the dam comes in and just uh, sorry, <laughs> <laughs> and just destroys all these habitats. Dredging causes a lot of sedimentation in the river, picking up a lot of different substrates, which will clog out and kill the mussels as well. So there's a lot of things that are affecting them and they're not doing too well. Now next. So that looks like the same site after dam removal is that, right? Yeah. Okay. So yeah, it's definitely a lot better. So invasive species, they play a lot into the harm that are being caused, um, being caused by mussels. Asian clams, uh, I brought them in here somewhere. I hope everybody got to see them. They're a lot tinier. 
uh, zebra mussels. That's what these guys look like. Maybe you should cook it again. Quagga mussels. Anybody who's taken IB bio. Yeah. We got yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Senegal. Like, so, invasive species. Oh, no. Uh, there's a couple different reasons why they impact mussels. One of them is they're just so prevalent and they spread so easily that they'll smother out and kill the mussels themselves. They'll actually be found growing on the mussels or they'll just take up all the spaces in which the mussels need to live. Like on the bottoms of all the uh, finger lakes, they're just covered and smothered with these mussels. Um, they also provide, uh, they also cause a lot of reproductive inter uh, interference as they'll be, they reproduce generally the same. And so all the current fish that are like there to be helping the reproductive cycle of these mussels are already being, I guess, I don't know, taken over by the other mussels. Next slide. So what are conservationists doing? Um, there's a lot of things they're doing right now. So they regulate a lot of sources of water pollution. This is like going out to different sites, such as like factories that are right next to rivers, going through, making sure all their systems are correct. Google dams, like we saw in a couple of previous slides. Uh, invasive species control. My sister's doing that right now. She's going out into the Great Lakes and preventing or extracting invasive mussel species, primarily quagga mussels. Um, riparian plants and forest buffers are a really important part of it. Uh, examples such as like uh, deep rooting trees next to the river basins will hold in all of the substrates preventing sedimentation or just deep riverbank erosion. If you click, I have, I have a photo example of this. Yeah, here we go. So here's like just a stream bed with riparian plants. As you can see, all of the big rocks and boulders are being held in, preventing the cut bank from just completely eroding away. Over here without riparian plants, it's just decimating the entire river, like stream bed, and causing a lot of sedimentation, which will just kill out all the mussels. And also recovery of species and relocation. If the environment is like going to be destroyed by plans that are taking out, uh, they'll just relocate them. Next slide. What can you do? Right. <laughs> That's me. Uh, yeah. I thought they just had a point. Yeah. No, and you should have pointed with the feet. Oh my god. Oh, Drew. Point with the point with the toes. Yeah. Um. First off, just leave them alone. Right. That's pretty pretty easy one, you know, let them fulfill their, their roles as water filters. Uh, don't introduce invasive species such as aquatic plants or more mussels. One of the main things for this, or anybody who owns a boat, practicing safe like boat maintenance to prevent the spread of mussels throughout different re uh, regions and different bodies of water. Um, absolving from the use of chemicals and fertilizers in like farms or the fencing in of certain animals like cows, or <laughs> like uh, other animals that provide a lot of waste that will, that could potentially leak into the watershed. And well, a really fun one, which I tried to look into, there's none going on near us, the closest one is in Michigan, but citizen science projects, uh, there will be groups of scientists and conservationists that will go out and flag uh, mussel species near you and collect a lot of data on the bivalve populations. You'll usually be allowed to participate in these because you know, they'd much rather have volunteers rather than pay for scientists to do it. So, usually it's just, and planting riparian plants near riverbeds or just creeks you have in your backyard. So those are ways that you can help. And also supporting your nearby, like, near you, like, organization. Next slide. Oh, and license plates. You can buy conservation license plates, which is pretty cool. Here's one of them, here's another one. And oh, here's another one. Bring seven. That's not a reading seven. I wish oh, that's, that's a really new bird. bird. That's a huge bird. 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 Well, these are so pretty, though. I'm totally Next slide. I'm actually going to get one. I wanted to get one, but they're $50 a year. And another fun note. Here's like, just yeah. some fun yeah. facts. Uh, uh, mussels are so effective at filtering water. Uh, snorkelers have reported that swimming over an area in a river with just like uh, a body of water, it can improve uh, visibility by like two to three feet in front of you as compared to like a river basin that has just like a couple inches of visibility. Camouflage. Mussels will typically get lighter or they'll change their color composition depending on where you go based on the geology of the environment, such as how like uh, the pearl mussels found up north near us. They're a lot darker like these guys because we have dark colored stones like slate stone. Um, uh, you know, you go further down and most of the rocks are made of like, sediments. 
so it'll be a lot lighter. Uh, they regulate their temperature through opening and closing their valve. Um, also, beds are spawning grounds for smallmouth bass, which are beneficial to both of them as it provides ground cover for the baby fish, and the smallmouth will also help to spread uh, the mussels' babies. We talked about this earlier. One gull mussel can filter 10 gallons of water in one day. <clears throat> Mussels will move and somehow like come into their own congregation and form a mussel bed. They don't really know how they do this, but they've found <coughs> just trails of mussels leading into one mussel bed, just like somehow, I don't know, like a like mussel sonar. And some people call them the liver of the river. Yeah, that cool. cool. Thank you. Liver of the river. Next. Next. Thank you. Uh, <laughs>